السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله in our course on essentials of Islamic beliefs in which we're looking at one of the classic primers of Islamic beliefs um, Imam Siraj al-Din al-Ushi's work, Bad al-Amali, we began last week by introducing the text. And we highlighted that there's three core objectives to this course. The first is to know what we believe. Secondly, to understand those beliefs with clarity so that we understand not just what we believe, but also something of why we believe it. And with that, also to touch upon briefly but consistently about how to cultivate faith and certitude. So these are the three central meanings that we are looking to emphasize in this course, right? So that we have leave this course with clarity of what we believe and why, and then how we should uphold this belief as people of faith. Today we're going to jump in to the text itself, al-Amali. And this text, as we mentioned, is in poem in poetry form, and it is a beautiful text in its expression, and it is representative of mainstream Islamic beliefs, the beliefs transmitted by the Prophet through successive generations to the great imams of the religion who did not come with something new, right? but rather they gathered and clarified what the Prophet ﷺ came with from his Lord. Right? So the role of the ulama, as Allah SWT tells us, that the role of lordly scholars is that you explain, you know, the, the lordly scholar is one who explains guidance with clarity, number one. Number two, they make the guidance clear. The duty of clarification entailed compiling texts that simplify and clarify the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah, but also that answer the questions that the scholars found that people would frequently or consistently ask. So the author begins, of course, with the basmala, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And then he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Yaqulu al Abdu fi bad il amali, Litawheedin bi nazmin kalla ali. So the servant says, in the beginning, in beginning this statement of, on divine oneness in verses like a string of pearls. So the author begins with the basmala but outside the text itself. Why? Because it's hard to fit Bismillahir Rahman Rahim in the text itself because Arabic poetry follows meters, follows certain rhyming patterns, but also because in order to preserve the meaning of Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, you keep it above. Because that's how Allah Most High begins his book. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to begin things. So there's a an implicit basmala there. So the author says regarding his poem, right? He says, Firstly, the servant says, right? the servant says, and this has an important meaning because he could have referred to himself as I say, or the author says, or many other things. He could have used his name, but he says, the servant says. Why would he do this, Sadati? Those of you who are online are welcome to, to jump in. Why would he say, the servant says here? Right. 
One is one reason is for humility. What would other reasons be? Yeah, so to be humble, that's that's one aspect, right? But humility is a quality, right? A humility is a quality, an attribute of the person. But slavehood is our reality. Right? Right? Slavehood is our reality. Right? Slavehood is our reality. Why? Because there are two types of slavehood. There is the slavehood of... Right? There is the slavehood of existence and there's the slavehood of choice. So the slavehood of existence is that everything that comes into existence comes to, it stands before God in a state of slavehood. What is slavehood? Slavehood is being owned and utterly needy. Slavehood is to be owned, dependent, and utterly needy. And that is the what's called ubudiyat al-wujud, the, the, the slavehood of existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there is nothing in the heavens on the, or the earth except that it comes to Allah in, as a slave, as a, in slavehood. And that is the slavehood of existence. That it is, inna lillah, we are Allah's. We are created by him, sustained by him, needy, on, needy to him, dependent on him for our very existence. And But then there is also the slavehood of choice. Allah Most High has granted this subtle reality of choice to humans and jinn. And that is the slavehood of of choice, right? the, the slavehood of choice, and that is an honor also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So the servant says in beginning this statement, right? and fi bad il amali, and some said that. Bad al Amali is not the actual title of the book because Bad al Amali is literally big, the beginning statement. So some said it's just the beginning of the book. So he said, the servant says in beginning his book, Bad al Amali, because Amali refers to that which is transmitted orally. Right? And in the science of hadith, especially, you know, the, the ulama, when they may, had a special gathering to relate hadith, for example, there would be someone who would, there would be people who would write down everything they say. I'm very often topical. So those are amali, a statement that is recorded. Because, but because a poem is typically recited, he's referring to this as Bad'il Amali. Is this the formal title? The commentators say, yes, this is the title of the book. Right? on divine oneness. Right? On divine oneness. Right? And that immediately he begins with the subject of the text. Because when you begin something, right, there are adab of beginning. One of them is make it clear, directly or indirectly. What are you talking about? So he says, لِتَوْحِيدٍ And he puts it in the indefinite. For those of you who know Arabic, لِتَوْحِيدٍ Right? And it's in the indefinite. There's no L there, correct? And the wisdom behind that is, when you put something in the indefinite, it's as if you're highlighting for that great subject of divine oneness. لِتَوْحِيدٍ بِنَظْمٍ كَلَّآلِ but when you begin something, you do have to promote it. Right? And there's two types of promotion. Right? There is self-promotion, which is not a religiously worthy endeavor. Right? Because it simply promotes the self, the ego. Right? 
the Inus. But there is a promotion of the good done for the sake of God. Right? And that is good. Right? Because if you have anything of the good that you want to spread, it would it's entailed by both reason and everything we know from Revelation that we strive to spread it as far and wide as we can, as best we can. So, so he says in poetry, بِنَظْمٍ كَلَّ آلِي in, in verses or in poetry, like a string of pearls. Like a string of pearls. Why would he refer to his own poem as being a string of pearls? Because it is worth it. It is a worthy poem. So he phrases it so that people can benefit. Because he said, I've written something that is on divine oneness. But then the question arises, why should I listen to you? Why should I listen to you? Why should I pay attention to this? So he says, this is like a string of pearls. It's like a string of pearls. Now, nothing is to properly arrange something. That's why um, poetry is called nothing. Because it is properly arranged. You can't just put words in any way. You have to make it fit the meter and the form and the structure of the different types of poem. So similarly, he's pointing to that, that this is not just a poem. But this is properly structured like, or properly arranged like pearls. Because if you have a string of pearls, you would arrange it in a way that brings out the beauty of the pearls. Right? Imam al-Busiri says in the Burda, وَالْوَرْدُ يَزْدَادُ حُسْنًا وَهُوَ مُشْتَمِلٌ The rose increases in beauty if rightly arranged. وَلَيْسَ يَنْقُصُ قَدْرًا غَيْرَ مُشْتَمِلِ Though it does not diminish in worth if not arranged. The rose is a rose. But if arranged well, it is of greater impact in its beauty. So similarly, here he praises his work so that people may benefit from it. And this, of course, highlights for us a practical principle that as a believer, do we praise our actions or our work or what we're trying to sell or promote or market? It's a very useful distinction. There's two types of praise. There is self-praise, which is blameworthy, and it can lead to sin, because it can lead to arrogance, it can lead to conceit, self-consequence, pride, arrogance, then can lead to looking down on others, and many, many other blameworthy qualities. But then there's also praising the good for the sake of Allah. Right? Praising the good for the sake of Allah, and this is praiseworthy. This is praiseworthy because we are called upon to spread the good. We are called upon to encourage others to do the good. But the key is anything that is, particularly in matters of religion or good, we begin with turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and intending to seek the pleasure of Allah in that matter to be in the circle of safety. So this is why he praised his book. So if you're offering a course on, on health, and if you say, well, I'm offering a course on health, but I'm not really an expert, and there's probably better courses out there, <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure you're busy. If you are, don't bother coming. Then people won't benefit, right? So this is why. Um, and like pearls. Wow. Right? Because pearls are precious, but also 
where are pearls found? Pearls, fa pearls early, are found in the depths of the ocean. So it says, he's saying, these are beautiful meanings that I've taken from the oceans of the meaning of the Quran and of the oceans of meaning of the Sunnah of our beloved Messenger, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. That's why he use, refers to it as like pearls. So that's line number one. And what is divine oneness? Right, that he says in divine oneness, right, the whole Quran is a call of what is the Quran? The Quran, as Allah subhanahu wa tells us, is Hudal lil muttaqeen. It is complete guidance for those seeking mindfulness of God. And, and this is the mindfulness of faith, then the mindfulness of submission, then the mindfulness of dedication to God. Hudal lil muttaqeen, from the opening of Surah Al-Baqarah. So the whole Quran is filled with proofs of divine oneness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ And your God is but one God. لا إله إلا هو There is no God but He. الرحمن الرحيم The merciful, the compassionate. And the very بسملة When we open our recitation, we say بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Like I begin by the name of Allah, I, by the one named God, by the one named Allah, who is the encompassingly merciful, and his mercy encompasses everything, so everything besides him only is by the mercy of Allah, the mercy of originating everything from nothing. Ar-Rahim, the particularly merciful, who sustains everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then tells us in Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is, all praise is Allah's, the Lord of the worlds, the Lord, the creator, the sustainer, the nurturer, the carer of all existent things. So both the basmala and when we say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen contain within them for the one who reflects proofs of who is God. And likewise, every part of the Qur'an, the central theme of the Qur'an is divine oneness. Right? And the statement of divine oneness itself, when we say la ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah. And this is a central theme of the Quran, is to realize the meanings of la ilaha illallah and why we should uphold Muhammadun Rasulullah. That there is no, there is no one free of need of any other whom all are in absolute need of but Allah. Anything besides God that you can see or consider, its fundamental reality is neediness. And all need an originator, all need a sustainer. That originator and sustainer, that is God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us in the Quran, in the 14th surah, Afillahi shak. Is there any doubt in Allah? Can there be any doubt in Allah, the originator of the heavens and the earth? So, this, you know, some people like saying strange things. So they say, you know, there's no, the Quran doesn't focus on proofs for God's existence. God's existence is obvious. Yes, God's existence is obvious, but the Quran is all signs and proofs. 
of the oneness of God. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us amongst the types of rational proofs is the reality of the need of everything for God, right? And that there is only one necessary existence. Everything besides Allah is originated. And anything originated requires an originator, one who brings it into existence. Right? And that originator can only be one. And this is a theme that Allah tells us to reflect on the createdness of the heavens, the, the earth, the alternation of night and day, the calls us to reflect on the on the birds and all these phenomena that Allah calls us throughout the Quran to reflect upon. And what is the central point of reflection? That these are all created things. They're all dependent things. Were they created from nothing? Or did they create themselves? Okay. And ultimately, and we'll look further down in the course on the details of this, but just to lay the groundwork, that originator can only be one because had there been more, more than one creator, more than one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَفَسَدَتَا Had there been any gods in the heavens and the earth, but Allah himself, both would come to rack from the strife, meaning they would not exist. If there's more than one God, right, then the world could not be. Right? One, because if you think about it, if there are two absolute beings, they could differ and Initially, you think there'd be chaos, but if you think through, this is there's a formal rational proof which we'll study later. But just to get a glimpse of it, that God, who is God? God is the absolute creator. Right? So, the absolute creator has will and power. They can choose anything, whether to do it or not to do it. And anything that they choose with their will, they can create with their power. That is God. The necessary existent who gives existence to all others. So if there are two gods like this, one could will something and the other could theoretically not will it. Now, something cannot be and not be at the same moment. So the one whose will comes to pass it would appear that they're God, so the other isn't God. But then the opposite could have been true, that the other's will could have passed, so ultimately neither would be God. So it's not just that the world would be in chaos, the world would not exist because such a God is not God. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Verses that our beloved Prophet وسلم, encouraged us to recite every single night. Right? And he himself would do this. And we know this in from the Sahih. And these are the final 10 verses of Surah Ali Imran, the third surah of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard. Truly, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, nahar, and the alternation of night and day, are a multitude of mighty signs for those of insight and mind. Truly, in the creation of the heavens and the earth. In the creation or in the createdness. So anything that you see, you know that it is necessarily created. And every effect requires a cause. Okay. 
If the cup was empty, suddenly it's full. How did it fill itself? How did it get full? Oh, it filled itself. That's not how things work. So we, we observe a relationship between cause and effect. But more than that, everything points to the reality that it is needy. Why? Because there's the fact that it's created, but also, and the alternation of night and day, alternation of night and day, ikhtilaf al layli wa nahar, alternation is change. Anything given to change is originated. Anything given to change is originated. It could not be eternal. It has a beginning and, and it has the potential of end. So therefore it is dependent on something to give it that origination. And if it is originated, it does not have intrinsic ability. It does not have intrinsic power. And that's what we affirm as believers. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله There's no ability whatsoever, nor any power whatsoever, except by Allah. Except by Allah, originating this thing. Except by Allah, sustaining this thing. Are a multitude of mighty signs. The ayat. So in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and there's levels of signs. Someone sees the created the thing, and then they realize, upon reflection, it is created. It requires a creator. That creator has power, will, knowledge, because they know what they're created. And then they come to the realization that that is God. And that is the God of the Qur'an. That is the God who is the subject of the truth claim of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Or someone realizes, like the believer, right, that th these are created things. And they behold the creative act, the khalq of Allah. Right? That Allah who khaliqu kulli shay, Allah is the creator of everything. So they behold, some people see creation and then through reflection they come to the creator. Others, the believer, we should strive to increase our consciousness so we behold the oneness of divine action. Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. Allah is the creator of all things. Higher than that, so is to behold the divine act. Hada khalqullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, this is the creating of Allah. And it's not just that Allah created it, but it only remains in existence because Allah is sustaining it. From moment to moment to moment. It has no intrinsic ability, no, no intrinsic power. And that is amazing. From that, we realize, we go from realizing it's created to coming to consciousness of the creator or to behold the, the creative act of the divine. This is Tawheed al-Af'al, the oneness of divine actions. But the actions manifest the attributes of their creator. Right? If some car company comes up with a new model of car, can you not tell that even without seeing the logo, who did that? Because there are characteristics that are manifest. But we see the manifestations of Allah's attributes of mercy, also of Allah's attributes of majesty in things. His mercy, his wisdom, his gentleness, but also his might, his wrath, etc. But there's also the reality of the absolute divine oneness of Allah himself. Because real existence is Allah's. The existence of created things is a gifted, dependent existence. And that's a higher level of consciousness. So this is why there are multitude of mighty signs in creation. 
in general, but then in all the specifics. Right? When you consider the specifics of something, in its qualities, in its beauty, in its wisdom, You see the marvelous ways where, you know, systems in creation are in this balance, this mizan. You realize that this could not be, رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا You do not create this in vain. There's a wisdom, mercy, and purpose in creation. How could this be an accident? Any one instance you could not believe that it is accidental. But for all of creation to manifest this wisdom, there are just six numbers that were they just slightly off in existence, the universe would not exist. I think it's Martin Rees, who was the head scientist, whatever they called them in England, has his book called The Six Numbers. But... The, well, the, these verses that the Prophet ﷺ would recite tell us about that change entails origination, right? And creation, right? Because what is creation but things and their attributes? There's formal terminology for this. They call, they call it essences and accidents. You don't have to worry about that. There's things and there's the attributes of things. And a thing cannot exist by, without qualities. You cannot have a wall that has no characteristics. The characteristics of things in existence are either changing or given to change. The fact that the wall is white tells you that it is created because it could be black. Right? So its attributes are merely possible. If the attributes are merely possible, it tells us that that thing itself is merely possible and dependent. Right? So anything given to change is originated. Because things cannot exist without attributes, so they themselves are originated. They have a beginning. Right? So change itself, you know, like when it's raining, so the sky, it was sunny and it was raining. Some people just see the, the fact that it's raining, I'm going to get wet, etc. You're stuck with creation. But you can go higher than that as a believer and realize, هَذَا خَلْقُ اللَّهِ This is the creating of Allah. And that's the, the key to step from misery to contentment, is to see things as being from Allah. And we know that, and in that creating, there is mercy, there's wisdom, there's purpose, there's good. How? We don't know. But beyond that, so that's the oneness of divine actions. هَذَا خَلْقُ الله. And we should train ourselves to see things from the eye of faith. This is the creating of Allah. When we consider, we realize that this manifests attributes, names and attributes of the divine. Because it is through that rain that water sources are replenished. That plants and vegetation and animals and human beings live. It gets very cold. And these are cycles that Allah has placed in creation that have great wisdom. They manifest. The, there's general attributes of might and mercy, but there's also specific attributes that they man manifest. And likewise in everything in creation, and that is the oneness of the divine attributes. That creation points to that. But all that is changing tells you this is merely fleeting existence. This is merely... Fleeting existence. Ultimate existence is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? 
necessary existence is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all these are meanings that just the faithful sight would point to. That faithful sight would point to for the believer. Because things cannot exist without the attributes, so they're originated. So everything around us, we behold this reality. And part of cultivating divine oneness right, is to train ourselves to look with the eye of faith. Look with the eye of faith. And that's one of the wisdoms of engaging in remembrance of Allah. Because they train us, right, especially because remembrance is meant to be of the tongue and the and the heart and our consciousness it's so that we can see things from the eye of faith the reality of when we say la ilaha illallah there's no god but allah that re, that marvelous reality that there is nothing free of need of any other whom all are in absolute need of except allah so these meanings that we learn these meanings that we learn, we cultivate by, the, by these statements. The Prophet ﷺ said, the best of what I and the prophets before me came with is La ilaha illallah. This is the hadith related by Imam Malik in his Muatta. Afdalu majitu bihi ana wa nabiyuna min qabli la ilaha illallah. The best of what I and the prophets before me have come with is La ilaha illallah. We do it not merely devotionally, just because we've been told to, that's good. But we do so faithfully, right? striving to be conscious of their meanings. That there's none worthy of worship, but Allah, there's none absolutely free of need of any other, whom all are in absolute need of, but Allah. If you keep saying that, and then you see something you're afraid of, what is it? It's a complete need of Allah. You consider some fear that you have. Whatever you fear is it's created. And if it's some worldly concern, and you put your focus on the one who is free of all needs, worthy of all praise. Similarly, subhanAllah, how glorious is Allah. You either say it considering created things. Like we often say something amazing happens. It's not just the Islamic wow, subhanAllah. Right? But rather... You consider whether it's the particularly good gulab jam, you say, subhanAllah, that's tasty. Right? It's creation, it points to an ultimate creator, and it's not your mother-in-law, right? right? But whether it be the fleeting gulab jamun, or it be looking at the fall colors, or it be some marvelous thing that happens you thought you'd blown your budget this month but you look at your bank account you actually do have money for the rest of the month so you don't have to explain to your husband where did it all go right? and these things happen say, subhanallah but these cultivate faith alhamdulillah all praise belongs to allah that's why we should we cultivate faith by reflection and then action that is faithful so then he tells us further on who is god who is allah so he tells us in line number 2 ilahu al khalqi mawlana qadim mawsuf bi awsaf al kamal so he lays down a general principle the god of creation our master is eternal and is characterized by all attributes of perfection. The God of creation, ilahul khalq. The God of creation, meaning creation. And this, of course, points to that proof that everything around us is, if you reflect on it but slightly, is created. All that is created requires a creator. And that creator could only be one. Right? 
An infinite regress is absurd, and we'll touch upon that a little bit later. Because with infinite regress, you've never, you've not established what began this, right? And we see what there's proofs why absolute eternity in creation is absurd. We have some resources on seekers if you want to rush into the answer, but we'll get to it step by step. Right? Our master, Mawlana. The Mawla in Arabic is a very interesting term. It, Mawla can refer to, wila, it's from wilaya, which is a, a relationship of association between two. So the Mawla is both the master, can also mean the one who's under the care of a, another. So, it, so slaves, when they would be free, they would be ascribed to a particular tribe or person. So they say, Mawla, Bani Quhafa, for example, right there, because it's this relationship of this association right, of either care or being cared for. But it's used like many terms in the absolute sense and the relative sense. There are some of our literalist brethren who object that how can you refer to a scholar as Mawlana? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say in the Quran, Anta Mawlana, you are our master. The simple concept that there's the absolute terms when they are affirmed for Allah, they're used in the absolute. Allah is the absolute master. He is our Lord. It's a Mawlana is the Lord and the one who cares for. Right? Right. Mawlana is also ter and therefore he is respected. Right? Mawlana is used for scholars, for example, etc., because they are respected and they take care of the religious well-being of the community. Right? And there's other. So it's a term of respect. There's the absolute respect and there's the relative. Otherwise, we couldn't say, that, are you knowledgeable? So no, only Allah is knowledgeable. Are you alive? No, because only Allah is alive. Do you have choice? No, because only Allah has choice. That's true in the absolute sense. But we affirm both the absolute and the relative. A simple concept that some of our brethren don't pay attention to. Qadimun, he is eternal and characterized by all attributes of perfection. So there's a few things. God, right? the term God, ilah, refers to the one, the one worshipped. Right? That just a God. The God, Al-Ilah, is, is Al-Ma'boodu Bihaq, the one who deserves to be worshipped. But the Ilah, right? the term Ilah, one of the scholars said that people were dazzled by the origins of the word God as they were dazzled by the reality of who God is. Because they say that ilah comes from wala, which is the, to lose your mind in the, in the magnificence of another. And there was actually one of the names for love. Wala, that, you know, the, that a pure-hearted lover, when they thought about their beloved, they'd lose their mind. They, because they're so dazzled by the, the, you know, the beauty of the object of their love. But now if that can happen in creation, what about the creator? Beyond that, right, so that's one. Or it's from ta'allu, is the one you are utterly devoted to. And the object of utter devotion. And that's the, the meaning of, you know, the, the one worthy. And that utter devotion is ibadah. It, it, it is Worship, right? Um, and, but what are the characteristics? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. He's Rabbul Alameen. He's the creator and sustainer, the Lord of the worlds, right? Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. Again, there are those who would say these definitions given by the mainstream school of Islamic beliefs, they'll argue this taken from from the Greeks, from the philosophers. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu khaliqu 
كل شيء الله is the creator of all things that's the definition A is B so one of the definition who is God God is the creator of all things that's a Quran it's a rational definition but it's also A because only the one who created everything is worthy of utter devotion so that is a definition from, from the Quran he is the creator. Right? And that's he points to that, right? Ilahul Khalq, the God of creation, or the God, you know, God, the one who has created all things. Who is our master? Who is our master? Because he takes care of our affairs, Mawlana. And because he takes care of our affairs, we are dependent on him. And anyone who does good to you, gratitude is due to them. In the Maturidi school, they would say this is rationally understood, that the sound mind would affirm without needing revelation, this conceptually, that shukrul mun'im wajib, the one who does good to you, gratitude is due. And they would say aqlan wa shara'an, rationally and religiously. And of course, we know that gratitude is due to the Creator. He is our mawla. He is our caring master. Of course, what is he? His, the origin of divine care is that he has created us. He sustains us. And then everything else. So worship to him. What is worship? Worship is how we express our gratitude to God. For the gift of existence. For the gift of life. For the gift of being a human being for the gift of faith, for the gift of guidance, and then the gift of all the goods that we have and the good that is around us. Right? So these are sort of seven elements of gratitude before any particular things come or not or don't in your life. The gift of existence, the gift of life, the gift of being a human being, the gift of faith, the gift of guidance, the gift of the particular good that you have and the good that surrounds you. Because the air that you breathe is a gift. Right? The weather, the shelter, all these blessings that are, surround us. So he's our master. He's the one who's taking care of all these things. He is eternal. He is eternal. And what we mean by the eternity of God is that God exists beyond time. Time is created. And it's a relative relationship between created things. Allah's eternity is that he is absolutely beyond time. Right? Time does not relate to Allah. So when we think about something that happens, it's not that, oh, now Allah did this. It's like he is not the super manager that suddenly, you know, team God is, you know, behind. So he brings on the super sub. No. Right? Allah exists beyond time. Time does not relate to Allah. Past, present, and future relate to creation, not to the creator. Right? And then he lays out a general principle on the attributes of Allah. Allah Most High is characterized by all perfection. And He is transcendent beyond all imperfection. So Allah is characterized by all perfection. Why? Because Allah exists beyond time. Any meaning affirmed for Allah is beyond the envelope of time and beyond the envelope of space. Because these apply to creation, they don't apply to the creator. So anything you can firm, affirm for Allah is eternally true and it's absolute. It does not have any limits. Limits apply to created things. The creator is exalted beyond all limits. How much mercy that, uh, does Allah have? It's eternal. It is absolute. How powerful is Allah? He's eternally powerful and absolutely powerful. So anything you can affirm for Allah as an attribute is eternal 
and it is absolute. There's no limits in it in eternity. So he's characterized by all ap characteristics of perfection. So in that regard, we have to understand when we say Allahu Akbar, when we begin the prayer, it's not that God is greater. It means God is the absolutely great without limits to his greatness. That is absolute. It's not a numerical greatness. That okay, we have 10 units of greatness. Allah has 100 trillion units. There's no units. Allah Allah and his attributes are beyond number. And Allah's oneness is absolute. When we think about that, we're just completely humbled. And that's why the early Muslims said, كُلُّ مَا خَطَرَ ببالك فالله بخلاف ذلك. Anything that occurs to your mind, Allah is absolutely distinct from it. Right? Because Allah... Like that's the perfection of Allah. Allah is eternal and absolute in his perfection. Anything besides Allah is originated. It is created. It is bound by time, bound by space, bound by limits, even if great, even if great. And then in line three, he tells us, he is the living, the executor of all matters. He is the real, the powerful, the all majestic. Right? So there are a few lessons here. Right? He is the living. Right? This is, of course, one of the divine names. Right? al hayyul al-Qayyum. That is mentioned in Surah, in Ayat al-Kursi, for example, and elsewhere in the Quran. al hayy the living, is the one who, who has absolute life. Right? And who is the giver of all life. So he has absolute life. His life is independent. And all other life is dependent on his creating it and his sustaining it. And he is the executor of all matters. Why? This relates to his being Al-Qayyum, the sustainer. That everything in existence is sustained by Allah. خَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ وَقَدَّرَهُ تَقْدِيرًا Allah has created all things and specified for them all their characteristics. So he is the mudabbir. بِيَدِهِ الْأَمْرِ In his grasp are all things. هُوَ الْحَقِّ And this returns to Allah's will and his power. Right? He is the real, al-haq, or the true. He is the real, right? because any th there's nothing that you can affirm that, that is more true than the reality of God. Right? That's why the one, one of the names. Al-haq, the real. Right? He is the most real in his existence. Right? So he is the most fundamental truth. Right? Okay. Al-Haq. Other truths right, are, even if, if you say, well, what about one plus one equals two? But the one only is by the virtue of the fact that Allah, if we're talking about an actual, an actual one plus one equals two. This is by Allah and this is by Allah. Okay? So it is, every, every other truth only is because Allah has made it. Even your mind in being able to conceive of truths, the mind itself 
is created by God. The order by which we can affirm things that are the building blocks of affirmation are all granted by God, are all granted by God. Al Muqaddir, he is the powerful specifier. Right? Powerful specifier. Why? Because all that happens in existence happens by Allah specifying it with His will and originating it with His power. Right? So He's the Muqaddir, Dhul Jalali, the Lord of Majesty. The Lord of Majesty. Why is He the Lord of Majesty? Because He is. He is characterized by all attributes of perfection, of greatness. But yet he deals with us on the basis of mercy. So that causes us to be further humbled. Because we, you know, because the reality of God is what? His command. If he wills something, is merely be and it is. Or don't be and you're not. But the very fact that we remain in existence, you could be just zapped out from existence. But Allah deals with us with lutf, with subtle grace, with rahmah. Right? Rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. My mercy encompasses all things. What's a thing? A thing is something that exists. All of this is under the lutf, that sustaining grace of Allah. Dhul Jalali. Right? So from this we understand that Allah, that the way we come to know Allah is by knowing His names. The way we know Allah is to know His names. And one of the ways that Allah tells us about Himself in the Qur'an is that throughout the Qur'an He mentions His noble names. And that's one of the areas that even in your recitation of the Qur'an, what should you do? If you come across a name, it's not just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just it's not just a superficial meaning. It's good. If you see, oh, Al-Mudabbir, I know that's the planner. But what does it mean? Okay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an to, to have tadabbur. What is tadabbur? The dubur of something is his back. Because tadabbur is to go beyond just the surface meaning to encompass the thing, right? right? So you go inside it and around it. That is tadabbur. You say, oh, that's my neighbor's house. Right? But to go into, you, do you really know the house? Yeah, it's his house. A is B. But the difference between saying A is B and I really know A. Do they not reflect on the Qur'an? And one of the keys of reflecting on the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is a call of the Creator to His creation, to return to Him. But He's telling us about Himself. al khabir. So when you recite, just one of the practices of the early Muslims, that interestingly, intelligent people around Human civilizations would do this. When they read something, they'd keep a notepad and a pen or whatever writing instruments they would have and make a note that I don't know what this means. What is al-muntaqim? And that's why all of us should have a good work of tafsir and we should have at least one book on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least I can understand a little bit about it. And sometimes books go into a lot of details. Not every book is supposed to be read from cover to cover. Sometimes you have to just jump in and jump out. Right? So, so I just want to know what it means. I don't want the whole explanation. Maybe you put a bookmark. I'll get back to it later. Right? And when you do this, our, our mashayikh tell us that don't interrupt your recitation with this. Maybe just look up the word. Okay, so I, you know what it means if you're trying to reflect. But... After the recitation, go back to it and try to understand. Right? And one of the most useful things to 
be able to reflect on is the divine names. The, the divine names themselves. Right? Right? So here he tells us that Ilahu Khalqi, the Lord of creation, our master, and then he tells us about Allah SWT, by his names. Lillahi al-asma'ul husna. Allah's are the most beautiful of names. Fad'uhu biha. So call upon him by them. And this is a key to the cultivation of faith. As our Prophet ﷺ said, Allah Most High has 99 names, 100 less one. Whoever encompasses them enters paradise. Right? How do they enter paradise? They say, well, devotionally, by fulfilling a prophetic a divine call and a prophetic encouragement, but because encompassing them in meaning, in consciousness, in awareness, in turning, is an ascent of you as a merely fleeting worldly being to being a faithful, conscious servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Then he tells us, Muridu al khayri wa sharh, yini, wa sharri al qabihi, lakin laysa yarda bil muhali. Says he wills both good and evil and the vile. However, he is not pleased with the wrong. So this is one of the things that people would be confused about. Right? And we have, for example, a number of faith traditions that keep talking about the problem of evil. Sometimes they call, give it a technical term, theodic theodicy, etc. Why? That God must do the good. But this comes from a dualistic tradition that there's a God of good and there are forces of darkness and there is a war between light and darkness. Yes, we affirm that there is light and there's darkness in creation. And this is an ibtila, a, a test from Allah. There's a wisdom both in good and in evil. Why? That's tahqiqul ibtila. Right? This is part of the exam. And exams are meant to be testing. The test of good is gratitude. The test of the bad is steadfastness, is sabr, to remain firm on what is pleasing to Allah in faith and faith, action and attitude. So he is the creator of all things, whether it be good or bad, So it is all from Allah. The enemy that is attacking you. Is it attacking you this in spite of God? No. That too is a test. So the eye of faith sees everything as being from God. And so we don't see a problem of evil. The fact that another earthquake came to our brethren in Afghanistan. From Allah. Some land has an oppressive ruler who's killed Thousands of innocent souls. That too is from the will of Allah. It's a test. The one who responds to the test with faith and steadfastness is eternally in paradise. They pass their test. They pass their test. Right? But he is not pleased with the wrong. But he is not pleased with the wrong. Why? Because that wrong, right and wrong, good and bad, do not relate to God. I have a spare cable, I put it in charity. I just put it away. It's my cable, I can do what I want with it. Even though our ownership is limited. Allah can do whatever He wills. It's His creation. He created it without it owing existence to Him. However, so good and bad do not relate to God. If Allah took at this moment 
all existence stopped. Is there anyone to say, why now? There's no one left to say why now. It's all his. That's why we say, inna lillah. Indeed, we are Allah's. Wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And indeed, it is to Allah that we are ever returning. So, good and bad do not relate to the actions of God. Good and bad relate to the choices of those morally responsible, humans and jinn. And those are manifest in how you respond to whatever Allah sends you. If you respond in accordance with the divine command, that is pleasing to Allah. If you respond Contrary to the divine command, that is displeasing to Allah. So in that sense, if a blessing comes to someone, they got a job. Is that good for them or bad for them? They got a good job. Halal, tayyib, job, everything. Is it good or bad? Hmm? Is it good or bad? It is good or bad Accord, in accordance with how you respond to it. If you respond to it, right? And there's two basic responses, which are shukr or sabr, gratitude or steadfast patience, right? So pleasing things, you have gratitude. You see them as from a, being from Allah. You ascribe the blessing to Allah and you resolve to respond to the, to direct this blessing towards the pleasure of Allah. So it, then it's good for you. Otherwise, it could be bad for you. The person, before they didn't have a job, so they couldn't spend on the haram. Now they got a job, so they get a mortgage. They buy a car through haram financing. They start spending on haram things. They start going to steakhouses that serve haram meat. Well, because I wanted to try Wagyu or whatever they wanted to try. And they do this and they do that. It looked like good. But good and bad relate to the choices of human beings. So two people were in a boat, a storm came. One survived, the other drowned. The one drowning, which was good for them? The one drowning responded with faith. They're dead, but they died a martyr. The other one survived. Said, I did it, I did it. They got to the shore and they committed a whole bunch of haram and they drifted away from deen. Good and bad do not relate to what is from Allah. Right? This world is a test. And good and bad relate to the choices of the, the, of people. Okay? And Allah's pleasure relates to directing what Allah has sent us in accordance with his pleasure. That is when something is good. And if it's good, it is pleasing to Allah. So husn and qubh, good and bad, relate to the choices of those morally responsible. Other things are ibtila, they're tests. So that's what we wanted to highlight today from the first four lines of this text. And trying to highlight these key meanings that we are focusing on in this course. To know what we believe, to have clarity about why we believe it and beyond that to cultivate our faith and certitude and inshallah if you've registered for this class you'll find these slides you'll find the text and also there's an accompanying work um, by a great Andalusian scholar um, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi it's called the light off or the, 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 the clear light. Um, it's a wonderful work on an introduction to Islamic beliefs. Ibn Juzay was a great 5th Islam, century Islamic scholar. Um, brilliant, very clear, and it connects the core Islamic beliefs with um, the key Quranic proofs for them. Um, and we have permission from the translator, who's a long, long standing friend, uh, Sheikh Fahim Hussein from Durban, South Africa to share it with you.
So we're going to stop there. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Any questions from today's class? Yeah, so the, the issue of worship being entailed by God. No, so it, we worship Allah for multiple reasons, right? Ultimately, post facto, because Allah has commanded it. If you don't understand why, you still have to do it. Now, we live in funny times, but the basis is if you work for someone, they tell you to do something within your, within your responsibility, you have to do it. So there's someone who's works in sales and say, um, can you go to section A, please? And they go away. It would be reasonable for them to wait for three hours because I want an explanation of why. No, I may be better for the manager to tell you why. It's more effective management, but they say, do this, you do it. And a good employee would do what they're told within the bounds of their responsibility. But who are we? We are servants of God. We are created to serve. But if you look at it in terms of reality, we are, you know, we, we are indebted to God for the, for the gift, for the, you know, for the gift of life, of existence, of life, of our humanity, of our faith, of guidance, of the specific good we have the enveloping good around us, the rational response to the good of another is gratitude. Now, how do you express gratitude to God? It is through worship. Now, Allah deserves it regardless. But that's why the Prophet expressed both meanings. You know, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا shakura. Should I not be a servant who is truly grateful? A servant is one who recognizes their master as their master and who acts in accordance to the command of their master. That's to be a servant. And who is truly grateful, who beholds divine blessings and expresses the requisite gratitude. But shakur, truly grateful, is to behold both the pleasing things and the displeasing things as being blessings from Allah. That's the difference between the shakir the one who has gratitude is the one who sees nice things and ascribes them to God. But the shakur, the truly grateful, sees everything, pleasing and displeasing, as being blessings from Allah. And responds accordingly. There's a question. If we say that Allah Most High is beyond time, how can we also say that He is the one who sustains everything at all times? Because Allah, who, create, who creates and sustains space and time itself? That is sustained. You can conceive of space and time as an envelope, as a, little, as a, as a bubble. It is Allah who is sustaining that bubble and all that is within it. All of it is enveloped by kun fayakun, be and it is. Um, the, the scholars talk about the attachments of divine attributes. So Allah's attributes are both eternal and some of them relate to created things. So for example, Allah's power is eternal. In eternity, Allah can originate anything possible or not originate it. Allah can create or not create in accordance with his will. So the attribute itself is eternal. It's a, it relates to something that happens in creation, which is that Allah Most High originates, actually originates some of the possible with some of the qualities possible for it in the context of time and space in accordance with what he has eternally willed, with his will. And as we look further at the attributes of Allah, we'll, we'll look at that. 
but that's a that's a very thoughtful question. Jazakumullah ta'ala khairan. Um, so we'll stop here. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. And inshallah in 10 minutes we'll be starting our class on the on perfecting prayer, uh, looking at the prayer of those close to Allah. Uh, so if you'd like to join us, we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And we'll just keep this class open for that.